Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca from Quail Words Books and I'm here to welcome you to Ron Rash and Randall Keenan in conversation. Um, we are adding more virtual events every week, so please be sure to keep an eye out for our emails or check our website if you want to stay up to date. Um, and I can also post a link in the chat to our upcoming events. And speaking of the chat, I want to very much encourage you. There's, you know, probably going to be about 40 or 50 of y'all watching this tonight. So if you want to talk to each other, uh, feel free to use the chat. Um, just make sure that you switch. There's a little two button on the bottom and it probably says all panelists right now. Switch that over to um, all panelists and attendees so that you can be talking to everyone instead of just the three of us that you see on camera right now. Um, but if you do have a question specifically for one of tonight's authors, please put that in the Q&A. So there's a separate button on the bottom of your Zoom screen that says Q&A. Open that up and type it in there. It just makes it a little bit easier to not lose your questions. Um, just a couple other quick notes before we get started. Your patronage of Quail Ridge Books makes events like these possible. Um, so even though we aren't physically at the store today, um, you can absolutely still support us by shopping virtually at quailridgebooks.com. And we do have signed copies of both of our authors' newest books at the store. Um, so please do uh, take advantage of that and order that. And another way you can support us is by becoming a member of Readers Club Plus. That is a new tier of Readers Club membership. Um, and if you enjoy these virtual events, but you can't always make them live, Readers Club Plus is a great option for you since you get a subscription to QRB TV, um, which is filled with recordings of our virtual author events. Um, um, with some other fun benefits as well. And uh, th that's all my fun information. So I will introduce tonight's authors and then hand it over to them. So Ron Rash is the author of the Penn Faulkner finalist and New York Times bestselling novel, Serena, um, in addition to a number of critically acclaimed novels. And he is the Paris Distinguished Professor in Appalachian Cultural Studies at Western Carolina University and lives in Clemson, South Carolina. And Randall Keenan is the former chancellor of the Fellowship of Southern Writers and a professor of English and comparative literature at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And he lives in Hillsboro. Guys, you can go ahead and take it away. Who goes first? Um, uh, well, I'm just, I'm gonna say that I'm, <laughs> grateful for Quail Ridge. Uh, they've supported me very early on and actually were able to get me uh, my first uh, agent. And uh, that was, so <laughs> I owe a great deal to the store and, and the belief, you know, in the work. And uh, I suspect, Randall, you found that they've been very supportive of you as well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I knew Nancy forever. I, I knew it when it was actually at Quail Ridge. And she was just the most darling woman. And um, she loved books and reading and recommending books. And, uh, and uh, yeah, the support has just been wonderful. I, 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 I love all the events I've done there. Yeah, and I think, you know, independent bookstores are so important. Uh, I, I'll, I'll speak just for myself, but I'm, I'm not going to be a John Grisham. You know, I'm not going to sell a million copies, but uh, the independent bookstores have been really essential for me, I mean, I think you get people there, uh, uh, you know, I think they, they're kind of saints because you know they're not gonna get wealthy doing this. <laughs> love books, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, they, they feel that's a mission, so. Well, you know my first job out of, out of, um, out of uh, college was working for a, a, a publisher in New York, and you would get to know the representatives, the guys who go around and sell books, and their love of independent bookstores was just so pure. I mean, and, and there was a time when every major city in this country had a major independent bookstore. And the ones who have been able to hang on, I have such admiration for. And their ability to come up with these sorts of innovative things during this time just shows how creative they, they're thinking. So yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you totally. 
Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about your book or read? I would love to. I would love to. <laughs> okay, I get to start, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, this collection of stories, if I had two wings, I think it's coming up backwards on, on the screen, is set in this little town in North Carol Eastern North Carolina, where I'm from. Um, and all sorts of strange things go on in this little town. Uh, togs, hogs talk, and um, women start committing miracles. If that's a great construct, a good construction, um, and I'm going to read you a, the beginning of a story about Howard Hughes, the aviator and billionaire, coming to Thames Creek, and we can talk about later why I wrote this crazy story. It's called "The Eternal's Glory That Is Ham Hawk." My mother did not tell me about Howard Hughes or his visit to Thames Creek on her deathbed. She had first mentioned that curious bit of family history several years before, while we shook and cleaned ears of sweet corn, fresh from the field, each kernel pearl white and sweet like candy. Who, I said absently, thinking I had misheard her, focusing instead on how good it was to be how good it was going to be to boil these ears up. A bit of salt, a knob of butter. You simply couldn't get corn like this in LA. The radio had been playing, and at the top of the news had been a report about another settlement in the ongoing battle over the will of the late great reclusive multi-gazillionaire. Who's that, I repeated? Howard Hughes, Mama said, came and asked me to come work for him. I didn't drop the corn exactly, for I believed I had misheard, misunderstood, misapprehended my mother. But I did squeeze it a tad over much, regrettably causing a bruise. What do you mean Howard Hughes wanted you to work for him? She had my attention now. Oh, it was a long time ago. We were living back at the other place, in Mama's house. Your daddy was stationed in the Philippines. Your sister was just a little bitty thing. Mama? Yes, baby? What are you talking about? She gave me that look that only a woman who had taught elementary school for decades can muster. Howard Hughes wanted me to come work for him. There is a moment when someone you've known all your born days someone you respect beyond reason, with the force of super superstition, there is a moment when that person says something so incredible, it forces you to recalibrate, rejigger, rethink the blueprints of the universe we each haul around in our head. Before I could say anything, she said, oh, but that was a long, long time ago, long, long time, before you were born. Why didn't you, what? when, mama? You're joking. No, she picked up another ear of corn. Mr. Thompson grew some good, pretty corn this year, didn't he? Mama, what? What did Howard Hughes, I paused, not certain if I wanted to know the answer to the question I was about to ask. What did Howard Hughes want you to do for him? She laughed. That laugh I now miss so much. Girlish. Eyes closed, involving the shoulders, not quite coquettish, but somehow apology and delight at the same time. He wanted me to come cook for him. Can you believe that? The richest man in the world. Shoot. <laughs> Good. Well, I've got one question about those talking hogs. Yes, sir. I hope that they, they, they are resigned to the fact that if they are going to be barbecue, they will uh, march up <laughs> to uh, Shelby, North Carolina at the bridges, which is my favorite barbecue joint. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, down in my part of the country, and I've, I, I've gotten in trouble for this sometimes, but um, we do whole hog. Yeah. It's got to be the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And Wilbur, Wil Wilbur's in Wilson is pretty good. 
Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've actually eaten there. So, yeah. I'm, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I was there for an event and, and ate there. Yeah, that was a nice piece. I enjoyed that. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. And are, so, is it in some ways like some of your other work where there are some of the stories use, I mean, what we might call, I would call folklore, some people might call magical realism, but just that sense of the, you know, that sense of wonder impinging into the, what we well, think. Thank, thank you for making that distinction because I think I, I, I the, the magical realism phrase really kind of feels tiresome. Yeah. And, yeah. and folklore is much more organic. Yeah. And then I grew up surrounded by people telling stories, I mean, octogenarians and nonagenarians. I mean, from, from when, I, when I was a little boy, and if you think about the Christian religion and the stories the Bible tells, I mean, you have people parting seas, you have men turning water into wine, <laughs> I mean, you know, you know all these miracles, and uh, if, if people take that seriously and apply it to their own lives, then it makes sense. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a way of looking at the world. Yeah, well, I think uh, I, I share some of that. I mean, I think I was very lucky in that I spent a lot of time with my older relatives, particularly my grandmother. And I think as writers, we, it was a great gift because it made the world more mysterious and wonderful. And I think that's that's all to the good uh, because I still feel that way. I, I find the world, uh, you know, amazing. Oh, yeah. And uh, so that, yeah, that being instilled in us is a, is a great gift, yeah. And I think, yeah, I agree. With, I mean, that's why I brought up the idea of folklore because I'm right. I, the you know, the magical realism. Uh, I mean, folklore had been around a lot longer than that phrase. You know? Yes, exactly. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, more people embedded in the landscape. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, are we going to hear from you? Yeah, I'll, I'll read a little piece, an opening. Uh, I, boy, this, this was a uh, kind of an interesting experience for me to write about Serena again. I didn't want to do the Ghostbusters part two. I mean, I, <laughs> it's kind of a, you, know, you, you know, you know you're starting to sink as a writer, I guess, when you start realizing, okay, I better go back to that one. I actually sold some books, you know. But I, at the same time, I, I felt, compelled for a number of reasons uh, to go back to that period. Uh, part of it was just seeing what's happening with the environment. I mean, that's something that, you know, we've got so much being thrown at us right now, you know, with the COVID and other matters that uh, we kind of forget that some really significant uh, changes is happening with uh, the EPA, uh, you know, uh, national parks, uh, salmon fisheries in Alaska are really in peril right now. And uh, so I wanted to go back and talk about environmental issues and particularly with the national parks in the wilderness because they're being besieged right now. So uh, I went back to 1931 and, and had Serena come back into the United States. Um, but I, I didn't, as I say, I didn't want it just to be like a sequel. So I, I really worked hard and I figured out, well, I'll write a novella because that's a form I've never done. And it's a hard form. Yeah, it is a very hard form. I, you know, Dennis Johnson has a great one with Train Dreams. Mm -hmm. So I uh, did that. But then, you know, I think what really brought me into that book was a, a character named Ross, who was a, a minor character in in, in uh, the novel, or relatively minor. And I thought his story and his attempt to save, uh, a, you know, Serena's former husband had a child with um, a young mountain woman and Ross's attempt to save that child and, and the mother is the center of the book for me. I mean, I, it was fun bringing Serena back. And uh, actually in the, in the little piece I'm going to read, we see her actually come back from, uh, Brazil, where she's been with, uh, you know, founding her empire there. But uh, she's come back, you know, for some final business, which includes uh, some final timbering in uh, the Western North Carolina mountains. When Serena Pemberton stepped out of the Commodore seaplane in July of 1931, 
a small but fervent contingent of reporters and photographers awaited her. Except for the pilot, she was alone. Those who would accompany her to the logging camp, both beast and human, had arrived by ship the night before. They were already on the train that would take them from Miami to North Carolina. All except for her minion Galloway, who procured an automobile to drive Serena to the station. As the metal ramp was ready, Galloway positioned himself beside the bottom step. He was short and wiry, shabbily dressed, a purple stump protruding from one sleeve. His cameras flashed mere inches from his face. He did not blink. As Serena descended, the first question shouted at her addressed the rumors surrounding her husband's death. For a moment, it didn't appear she would answer. But when her booted feet settled securely on the ground, the question was asked again, but with a caveat. Had she loved her husband? I loved my husband, but one always learns from disappointments. But what of his death, Mrs. Pemberton? And what of so many others of your acquaintance, the reporter asked. Logging is a dangerous business, she replied. Galloway was in front of her now, but Serena, almost a head taller, was clearly visible. He cleared a path as more questions came. Would she continue to fight against the National Park? And would she address the rumor that she was connected to the recent demise of Horace Kephart, the park's chief advocate? Did she oppose the Davis-Bacon Act? Why risk a transatlantic enterprise when she and her husband had achieved so much in the United States? Galloway opened the DeSoto's passenger door Serena was about to get in when the sole woman in the group, a reporter for the New Republic, stepped close. She was very young, but like Serena, tall and blonde. When will you have achieved all your ambitions, Mrs. Pemberton, she asked, as others jostled around her. When the world and my will are one, Serena answered. So, She's back. <laughs> I wanted her to kind of descend, uh, you know, kind of almost like a Valkyrie in, in Wagner, you know, out of the clouds, you know, a god. Yeah, you're Wagner, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, but also the uh, the woman who asked the question, actually, uh, that was Martha Gellhorn, who was a really a good writer. She actually wrote novels, but she was a World War II correspondent. And married to Hemingway. Yes, exactly. Mary, and Hemingway was afraid of her. <laughs> I mean, she was a tough one. She was fearless. You know, she went in, into the middle of World War II. So I thought she would be the one person who would not be afraid to ask Serena a question. Is there an eagle in this novella? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the eagle's coming back. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's too obscure a question for people who haven't read Serena. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, the eagle's back with her. You know, only Serena could have tamed an eagle. Yeah. You know, the moguls, I know you know, the moguls used to do that. Yeah. You know, Genghis Khan. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Actually, that's where I was doing research, and uh, I found one of 12 people in the United States who hunted with an eagle. And he, in turn, he actually... He was in Wyoming, but he in turn introduced me to some of the people in Mongolia. And <laughs> it's like thousands of years old. But yeah. They hunt wolves with those birds in Mongolia. And that, that's a badass bird that can do that. That is a scary bird. You don't want to Yeah, remember. yeah. And, and I mean, they can crush a human skull. I, I mean, they're amazing creatures. You know, owls can do that too. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that, yeah, they're they're scary birds in their own way. If they were bigger, we would have a real problem. And I was also, as you flying in 1930-something had to be terrifying. Yeah. I mean, you had to have, you know, you know, a lot of fortitude to do something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, I actually had to research that, and, and there were very few flights, but they actually were in 1931. You could get a, a plane, but uh, it was just beginning, yeah. 
Yeah. I'm trying to, I can't remember what I can, anybody can look it up, but um, when Lindbergh was in St. Louis, that just seemed, I mean, that wasn't that long afterwards, I'm thinking. Right. It wasn't that long after. I should know the date, but I don't, yeah. Well, I mean, and thinking about Serena and what she does and everything, I just, I mean, maybe this is too personal, but the town, the small town I grew up in, the largest landowner, recently clear cut this old growth forest. And it just like, you know, it, uh, yeah. And I don't understand. I mean, I, I know what money is, <laughs> but it just seems hard. Yeah, well, we, we've had some problems with that in, in, in Western North Carolina because of, uh, you know, there's been, a, as I've said, a relaxation of some of the EPA rate, and uh, they're letting people cut near the Chattooga River, in the, you know, and, and that, and, and several rivers, and, you know, that can destroy a, a river, uh, yeah. you know, and so, yeah, I felt, I felt that the story was timely. I mean, that's one reason I wanted to go back to that uh, period, and, uh, yeah. Well, I understand there are a great many stories about the Civil War in this collection. Um, well, a couple. Yeah, yes, a couple. And, and one in particular was one that I felt was very timely about uh, what can happen when people uh, allow themselves, particularly in a close-knit community, uh, to turn on themselves. And, and I mean, that, that to me is one of the most disturbing problems uh, that we see with the heat with humans. I mean, it can, it's happened again and again. I mean, it happened in Germany, obviously, but it happened in Kosovo, it happened in Rwanda. And I think you and I both fear, you know, that it could even happen here. I mean, uh, I think yeah. that's really scary about these times. Well, where I live here now in the Piedmont, I mean, a great untold story, and one of my stories tries to get at it, but I haven't done it explicitly. But this area was founded by Quakers. Mm -hmm. and it actually goes back to Daniel Boone, I mean, who was a Quaker. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in the years leading up to the Civil War, they were essentially exterminated. Yeah. Um, they did a lot of work with the Underground Railroad. Um, but, I mean, that's just... You know, it's a very rough part of our history. Yeah, and, and actually in Western North Carolina, and it's, <laughs> Ann, yeah. can you bring that photograph? It's, it's on the, in our room on the bureau, the bookshelf. Um, in Western North Carolina, it was very much, uh, there was a lot of that as well. And, and here's something a lot of people don't know about North Carolina, but there was a vote in North Carolina to whether to secede or not, you may know this, and it failed. They, the, the state voted not to secede, mm -hmm. but the, the slave owners, you know, who controlled Raleigh primarily, uh, went ahead with it. And uh, I was actually, uh, I thought this, this is kind of interesting. This is my relative. You can see that gaunt figure. <laughs> but notice the uniform he's wearing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he was, you know, he fought for the Union. So a lot of people in Western North Carolina, and, and in, in Western North Carolina, I mean, the vote in Madison County was like 260 to 20. You know, I mean, it's just, but we forget that. But yeah, it was a, it was a scary time and uh, for everybody, obviously. Well, I mean, I don't, I'm not paying attention to the time, but I did want to talk to you about one thing we, we talked about in the past, um, and that was the uh, massacre in your, I, do you consider South Carolina your home state? Well, or? my family was all from Western North Carolina. We kind of came down, my parents met in a cotton mill in Chester, and but they both come down from, from the mountains. Mm -hmm. and, and they went, you know, and uh, eventually when I was very young, pretty young, uh, we, uh, seven, eight, uh, we went back. So I've always, I've, I'm, I'm not ashamed of being born in South Carolina, but it was all my, all the family reunions, all the family was in Western North Carolina. But, but after the, what happened in South Carolina. Yeah, yeah after the shootings in, in Mother Emanuel, you got a lot of uh, calls, people wanting you to explain it, or I don't know what they wanted. They just wanted to talk to you, and it, it, it really bothered you, as I Yeah, recognize. well, I, I wanted to say the right thing, and I wanted 
to say the fairest thing, I mean, as, as you were, I mean, as, as anyone with any sense of humanity would know, I was horrified. I actually had to do a reading that night in Columbia, which was mm -hmm. far away. And, uh, you know, I didn't know if I could do it. I, you know, some, some people turned out and, and I, I said, you know, I, I can't ignore this. So what I did was, uh, there's a poem I love by Seamus Heaney. Um, and uh, I, I recited it. I mean, you know, and it starts, human beings suffer, they torture one another. They get hurt and they get hard. No poem or play or song can fully right or wrong, inflicted and endure. The innocent in jails beat on their bars together. The police widow in veils faints at the funeral home. The hunger striker's father stands in the graveyard dumb. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. And then, once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can prevail and hope and history die. And to me, that was, you know, I, I mean, we needed that. I mean, you know, that was my best response to everything. I, so I read, you know, I recited that, uh, it goes on. But uh, that just struck me that, you know, we need something that, you know, uh, I, I didn't have the words. Don't hope on this side of the grave. That is pretty. But then, oh. and then, and then once in a lifetime, the long for tidal wave. And I think that's what Heaney saw in uh, Ireland, you know, because it looked like that would never, you know, that conflict in Northern Ireland would ever be resolved. And, and yet it has been. So, Isn't that amazing? I mean, if you're of a certain age, the idea that the conflict in Ireland could ever, ever, ever have been resolved yeah. seems, I mean, yeah. I wouldn't have believed it. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it was, yeah, I mean, I, I was like you, this is just something that's so deep, because it was, so, you know, it was such a, I mean, centuries embedded, and yet they did it. And I think that, you know, Heaney, actually Heaney wrote that poem, uh, or at least, I think he'd written it earlier, but used Amnesty International used it. Yeah. Um, that you know we are changing buildings' names here. Our chancellor has stripped a lot of um, Confederate generals and uh, active anti-black uh, people from names of buildings, and they want to rename one after Pauli Murray civil rights activist from the 50s and 60s. And she has a poem similar, you know, hope is a thing with wings. I don't know if you know that poem. Yeah, uh, I know that phrase, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, what, what's her choice? You know, I've got uh, my son and daughter are still, you know, they're in their 30s. Uh, uh, you know, my James, my son, and Mackenzie, his wife, have just given us this beautiful baby just five months ago. And, uh, you know, actually, I dedicate this book to, to my grandchild, Collins. And it just, I've got to hope. I've got to believe. And, and actually, I, I think, all, that, you know, what's happened has, has influenced this book. As I was finishing it up, I realized that one aspect in the book I wanted to emphasize was that, that people who are in terrible situations, uh, somehow I'll get through them. Uh, I mean, you know, you know that from your own ancestors. Uh, you know, I know that. Uh, and and somehow they, they get through, and, and I think we have to remember that, and that, that we can't just give up and, you know, resign ourselves to despair. Yeah, no, I agree. I totally agree. I, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, when, I, when I'm working with young students, and I try to teach them about African American history, and they get, you know, oh, I'm that, that's just so depressing and whatnot. I said, like, no, it's not. I mean, think about the fact that these people endured, yeah. and that they got through it. All the things that they went through. I mean, I mean, that shows you a level of strength that you should admire and try to emulate. Oh, absolutely, and I think that's that's. Uh, the value of looking, you know, of history, of, of acknowledging yeah. that history. That uh, exactly, exactly. The horrors, but you also see the the courage.
And thank you for reminding me of the, the, the Irish conflict because I had not, I mean, that's, that's a good thing to hold in your mind, the idea that it actually was, I mean, that's, that's a great world success that they completed it. Yeah. And, and we can get through this. Yeah. Well, do we have some questions or? You do have some questions. <laughs> so, um, we can start with, uh, how about for Ron, listening to you read that excerpt of um, Serena, is Ayn Rand specifically the Fountainhead a work you've read and is it one of influence in your work? Yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, I did read, I have read Ayn Rand. I mean, I never was a follower, but I read her more with a very, uh, you know, with a certain degree of, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but yeah, but I, I think that idea of that kind of uh, amorality, that that sense that uh, one, uh, uh, yeah, I think yeah, I, I had Anne Rand in part, but but uh, she, I think Serena is also very Nietzschean. Uh, she 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 uh, attempts to be above good and evil. Uh, some people have you know, and rightly, I mean, obviously that is the Lady Macbeth and their connections there, but. Uh, I think Serena's a lot tougher than Lady Macbeth. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's the difference. And, and, and for me, I think uh, Serena's more a uh, Marlovian character, you know, uh, like Faustus. I mean, she, she uh, or Tamerlane, she, she doesn't look back uh, with regret. All right. And how about uh, for you, Randall, what was your journey from Brooklyn to North Carolina? And what are some of the cultural differences between those worlds that may influence your writing? Well, I first came to North Carolina when I was six weeks old. So there was no, I, I didn't know what the hell was going on. But after I left college, I went to New York and I did live in Brooklyn for quite some time. And I think I mean, that's before I wrote my third book. And I was very impressed by how diasporic Brooklyn is. I mean, you have black folk from all over uh, the diaspora, from Jamaica, from Martinique, from Africa. I mean, e everywhere. And, and that, that is a, a true, a melting pot within a melting pot in a way. Um, so we've actually got a couple same kind of idea questions um, from a couple folks that both of you can answer with uh, how is your writing going during the pandemic and these uh, current tumultuous times and are you writing about what's going on? How about that one, Ryan? I, I mean, if you had told me in December that I would be locked up in my house for four months with nothing to do but read and write, I would have, first of all, I would have laughed at you. And second of all, the idea that I wouldn't have done either of those things would have been really, really, I wouldn't have believed you. But I find it really hard sometimes to concentrate on the level that I want to. And so I have not gotten as much done as I would like to have gotten done. I mean, I feel like I should have read every book in my house that I haven't already read. Um, but one day. Ron, you, you're probably much more productive than I am. Well, I, I don't know about that, but I, in a way, I, I was finishing up my book when the uh, virus hit and it had an influence on the book. Um, you know, I actually added a section about the 1918 flu epidemic and, and the Serena portion of the, no, you know, the novella. Mm -hmm. And I also have a, uh, it, it really shifted the tone of the book. I had about 15, 16 stories and I chose nine, but I was very, uh, the tone, the more somber tone, I think, was in part a reflection, but also I tried to choose stories where, uh, as I said earlier, people were doing the best they could 
in the you know, in very tough situations. And mm -hmm. I, uh, so that happened and I'm very superstitious about what I write and, 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 and not talking about it, but I will say I am writing. Uh, and for me, it's been an escape uh, from uh, reality in some ways. And I'm reading a lot more. Uh, and, and that's good. Uh, the same way I'm using, you know, I'm using it as a way of uh, just recharging. I mean, not that you want to deny what's going on. I'm quite aware of it, but I, I need certain breaks from it. Uh, so that, yeah, that's what I've been. If you think about the material we've been given, uh, uh, the pandemic, the election, the unrest in the streets. I mean, this is, think of what Victor Hugo would do. <laughs> Oh, yeah, epic. I mean it's epic. Uh, it's epic. Well, I think yeah, I think some really significant work is going to come out of this moment. Uh, I really do, and uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure who will write it, but but it, it will be there. I think. Yeah. I mean, this is what you know. Uh, I think Graham Greene said that uh, 400 years of peace and prosperity and all the Swiss gave us was a cuckoo clock. The cuckoo, yeah, the third man, yeah. Yeah, you know, so, you know, we, when you get thrown into this kind of turmoil, I mean, as horrible as it is in many ways, I mean, that, that's kind of when art happens very often, particularly yeah. I think literature. Uh, it, it, it's out of that tension. All right. How about, um, so how do you approach the writing and revision process for your short stories? Well, I'll start this one, um, Randall, if that's okay. Uh, I find that short stories are the most difficult to write. I've written novels and poetry, and I think it's because I have to bring everything I bring to a poem and, and just about everything I bring to a novel. I mean, a sense of narrative completeness, uh, a sense, uh, as in poetry, of every syllable being in the right place. Um, so for me, it's just uh, a lot of revision, a lot of um, really just trying to make every, every word count. And I tend to do a lot of drafts. I, I, you know, I'll usually do about 15 drafts on a short story. Uh, and uh, I just keep working and keep working. I, and I think it was a, a French poet, maybe uh, Mallory, I may once said that uh, uh, poems are not, a, you know, not finished, they're abandoned. And I kind of feel that way with everything I write. I, I always, particularly afterwards, you know, I don't like to look at what I've written because I always find something I should have done better. But yeah, there's a point where you have to kind of let it go. Ron, I mean, I don't want to embarrass you, and forgive me, I can't remember the title, but the uh, Crystal Meth novel. Oh, yeah, The World Made Straight, yeah. The World Made Straight, exactly. I mean, there is, there on every page, there are like three sentences that I swear I wish I could have written. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how you accomplish that. Um, uh. I mean, it feels like a short yeah. story. It has that level of concentration. Yeah. I mean, do you find that to be true, though, with the story, just that the intensity of writing one and trying to get everything right? Yeah, but you know what? I, I appreciate it because I can read it in, you know, a, an hour or two or less. I hope or less. Or I don't know how long it takes other people to read. But uh, I like, I mean, with a novel, you have to, I'm just practically speaking, it's hard to read through the whole thing at once. Yeah. Uh, I mean, unless you go down to the beach. <laughs> you know, well, like yeah, I, th I think short stories are, you know, we're, we're our, our uh, attention spans are, are shrinking. And, and in a way, I think they're perfect <laughs> in some ways for what's for the world we're living in now. But, uh, oh, I love, I mean, when a short story is done well, it is a marvel. I mean, yeah. yeah. The great I mean, someone, someone asked me yesterday, what was my favorite? short story and do you know miles city montana by alice monroe i do i do and, and the idea that she starts i mean it's totally counterintuitive mm -hmm. that she starts with this detailed memory 
and then tells you why the woman had the memory. I mean, that was just, that's just a stroke of genius. Oh, well, she's my favorite living short story writer. <laughs> a, a story, uh, Corey, and uh, I was actually on the uh, judging for the O. Henry Awards a few years ago, and that story came up, and I read it, and I knew I already kind of liked, I, I, I love Monroe's story, and, and you could tell, I mean, I could tell it was Monroe, even though they were, were judging blind, and I, I'd read it in the New York or anywhere, mm -hmm. but I really didn't want to feel like, okay, I'm just caving to this story. Yeah, you know, and but I asked myself, what is it that this story does that these other 20 you know, very good, excellent stories, many of them, yeah. did? And and it was what I what I realized was it was as if the story was writing itself. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, I think you know what I mean by that. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. And, 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 and that to me was just marvelous. I mean, it was almost like the, the story itself was dispassionate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it, it didn't really care what we thought or what these characters were like. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, uh, and, and that was you know, the best way I could articulate it, what she does. In a I am not a woman and I'm not a, 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 a parent, but I mean, that, it's just what you're saying. I mean, it just made me think I understood what it was to be those things. And that's what you want. Absolutely. And I teach that story. Yeah. The Mile City story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads perfectly into another question. Um, so who else do you like to read? Go ahead, Randall. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had I a like read Randall Keenan and Jill McCorkle. And <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that, that town over there, is Clyde still come around? Uh, he does. He does. He still has yeah, a place I mean, in Durham. Yeah, Hillsborough, uh, every time, you can't even turn over a rock without a rider hiding <laughs> under it. Danis. Well, at the top of my list would be Ron Rash. Uh, I met you when I think your first book came out at, at David Payne's house. You did. I remember you coming to that. That was very generous. Yeah. <laughs> But I also I had a, I, I was usually impacted by the uh, Latin boom writers. Um, I, I think I, I don't know if I mentioned Garcia Marquez, but all those South American writers who I felt gave me permission to explore what Ron was talking about earlier, the folklore uh, that I grew up in, and I think I needed that at some point. Yeah, I. I mean, you know, if we go back farther, I, Dostoevsky had the biggest impact on me. Um, I read him when I was 15 and I was, I had no, you know, I missed probably 20 levels of crime and punishment, but that moment when the uh, pawnbroker, you know, was killed by Raskolnikov with the ax, that, that just took me into another place. And I, I've said this before, but it was the first time I hadn't entered, a, it wasn't so much I'd entered a book, it was like the book entered me. Mm. He remains, and I think he's very relevant right now. I actually went back and reread The uh, Possessed, and I mean, it's eerily uh, timely right now. Uh, I, I recently read Hillary, finished Hillary Mantel's trilogy about Henry VIII, and, and that was fascinating. And I haven't, I haven't read it yet. Oh, the third one, you mean? The third one, yeah. Yeah, the third one is, wow. And what I love about that is what I, you know, a lot of times people, when, when you're writing about the past, when I'm writing about Strain 1931, there's this sense, well, this is only the past, but I think the best, when, when work that's said in the past works best, it's almost subversive because the reader thinks this is such a different world, and then the reader has this realization that the world is actually, this is the present. You know, this, this is also the present. And what Mantell does magnificently in all three of those books, you know, starting with Wolf Hall, is she, Cromwell, is, it's about the middle class. Yeah. And how tenuous that is because he's always in abeyance. He's always aware that at any whim, you know, he, he can be lost. He's always aware of that. And, and, and to me, uh, yeah, those are magnificent books. And I found myself going back to poetry. 
uh, yeah, I think poetry serves us at, in times that, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we seek something higher. Uh, I've been rereading Hart Crane, uh, a, a poet I love, and uh, reread James Dickey, who really writes well about the landscape. He's very visceral. Yeah. I was just thinking about Dickey. I came to visit you at Western Carolina, and you were reviewing this massive biography of Dickey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, Tisa wants to know if y'all have read Lee Smith's new novella, Blue Marlin. It's classic Lee. Well, th this is, I, I suspect, uh, I, I have not, I've got Jill McCorkle's book, Lee's and Randall's, and, and they're all awaiting <laughs> me, and uh, I will get to them, but it's, you know, it's just a weird time, and uh, even getting the books, I mean, I'm ordering them actually from uh, uh, Malaprops and, you know, some of the, the independents, um, but uh, yeah, they're lining up. I mean, it really, it's interesting, all these, you know, all these writers by, not only really great writers, but friends are, are coming out, so yeah, we're, I think we're, it's, it's kind of like a, a train, we've got a lot of boxcars on it, right? Yeah. Amen. Amen. No, I haven't, and I haven't read Lee's book yet either. Sorry. Um, all right. Well, I will uh, say that I will let me let me do say that Lee Smith had a huge impact on my work because uh, I remember um, going to the library and and checking out oral history, and I thought, wow. You can do this. <laughs> I mean, you know, not just that kind of Appalachian, not nostalgia, but that just that I guess uh, realism. And and suddenly Lee just kind of like Fred Chapel did, and I'm one of you forever. I mean, just took it to another place. And uh, and Lee is, I think, uh, somebody asked me fairly recently. She said, "We, well, you know, you, I mean." You, you don't seem to, to, you know, go out getting drunk at readings and screaming at people. I said, well, you know, I've been taught better. <laughs> Lee Smith and, and Robert Morgan, you know, you know they, we just, you know, that's just not what we do. You know, that just, you know that I would be, I would feel like I'm letting them down because they're such generous, good people. Uh... Let's see, I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. Um, so we'll start with Randall for this one. Um, Tony says he's a big fan of the first person narrative. Can you both talk about how a different perspective might suggest itself to each story? Um, he was particularly blown away by um, Lard and Promises narrated by Randall. Um, I, I think, well, I had a very wonderful teacher, Doris Betts, um, here at UNC, and she always warned us that first person is probably the hardest point of view to write from, because people think it's, 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 um, confessional, and I think the best first person stories are not necessarily confessing, but creating a persona. I mean, that's what makes Jill McCorkle so strong, that she is creating a character um, with their own words. I mean, I love teaching her story. And another, I'm, 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 I know I'm being very Hillsborough-centric right now, but Alan Greganis almost exclusively writes in the first person. And um, again, it's about creating a character. It's not necessarily about confession. And I think if you can differentiate between those two, you're, you're doing well. Yeah, uh, yeah Doris Betts, The uh, Ugliest Pilgrim was a story that had a huge effect on me. Uh, you know, oh, she yeah. <laughs> a young woman on the bus and uh, I'll never forget that story. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I do write first person, sometimes third. I think the, particularly the challenge if you're writing about people who are not necessarily you know, educated as far as the sense of being in school, 
but are very intelligent is, is to show that intelligence and not use the dialect, but not let the reader condescend. And, and I've found the best way to do that or the way I do it or try to do it is uh, through simile. Because I think what a lot of times it's forgotten when we look at folk languages, whether it's you know in the Appalachians or Cajun or Gullah, is there's a connection to nature first, which is of course universal, uh, but also it's very rich in simile. And uh, that to me, that is, you have to be intelligent to create a simile because you're taking two unlike things and, and finding a connection. And uh, I'm, this is a, an example I've used before, but my uncle who probably had a sixth grade education uh, at most, uh, we were in Boone when I was a teenager, and I, I looked over at a, you know, attractive Appalachian young lady, and he saw me looking at her, and he said, this was summertime, he said, that girl hasn't got enough clothes on to wad a shotgun. <laughs> and, and later in graduate school, you know, we were, you know, we, we're all intellectual in graduate school, and, and we're, we're, we're discussing what, what makes a, you know, a poem or poetic language, and I just kept thinking everything that we we're talking about, my, my uncle nailed. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is, is a part of, I think, first person is, is, you know, some of the challenges is how, how do we use the language and, and, and sometimes the, the figurative language to, uh, to reveal intelligence, character, depth, you know, whatever else you want to bring. Red Chapel has a character and, and, uh, she says, uh, she's talking about her son-in-law and his best friend's, uh, best friend's uh, brains. And she says, they're not, not any bigger than June peas. <laughs> what I love about that is not only is it perfect because it reflects the world she's in. I mean, this is a woman who would know about June peas, but she's also, it also shows that I, I think uh, uh, creativity. Well, I think, I mean, I mean, that, for me, I, we were both lucky in having great wealth and knowing these people intimately and getting to know their language. And, and it's, it's natural. It's not, they weren't striving. I mean, they weren't, you know, straining to come up with this. It just came yeah. out of them naturally. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I love about it. I mean, I, I think there was just a, del you know, a, and I mean this in the, in the most, just a kind of delight in, in you know, not, in a in an intellectual way, but just yeah, just making uh, being observant to the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember fishing with my mother one time down at, at, at Topsail, and this man standing next to us said, "My daddy was so cross-eyed he could stand on Wednesday and see Sunday and Monday at the same time." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's rich. It's a Trevor treasure yeah. trove, no doubt about that. I, yeah, I love I love that. I love that uh, those languages. And one thing I found kind of interesting, I mean, just to tie into this, was uh, when I was writing One Foot in Eden, which is probably the book, my first novel, and it was probably my book. You know, as far as going deepest into dialect, uh, I was teaching at a community college. I was teaching six classes a semester. So it was, I could barely remember <laughs> what I was talking about. You know, is this English 101? Is this British literature? And uh, I, I was actually, I was teaching Beowulf uh, to a class that at 8, 8 a.m. And of course they were all most part asleep, but I, 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 I'd been writing, I got up early and I'd written two hours from this voice of a, you know, like a 17 year old Appalachian woman. And I said, I was talking about Beowulf, and I said, well, it'd be like as if. <laughs> and I, you know, I was still in that voice. Of course, nobody, none of them were, at, you know, even blinked, uh, you know, uh, or opened their eyes, but it, I, I was that deep into the character. And that's, I mean, do you ever feel like you're almost channeling these characters or getting in? Or I, I don't understand how you can do it if you don't. I mean, yeah. it seems, yeah. it always, I mean, that, I, as a kid, that, you know, you became, you know, you're out in the yard playing. I mean, this, it always felt like an extension of that. Yeah. Where you, where you, you become the character. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like method acting, I think, in some ways. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. 
and I got that reference to the Pentecost. Ah. With tongues like as if fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we are um, right at eight o'clock. I don't know if you all have any final thoughts that you want to share before we wrap it up. Well, it's just been great. Uh, you know, Randall and I are, are good friends and, uh, you know, we haven't had been hadn't chance to be much in touch lately. You know, we missed the uh, fellowship this year. That was a shame. Yeah. And uh, we usually get together for a couple of days then. But uh, yeah, it's been a good event. Uh, I hope I hope Quail Ridge is doing great through this, or as well as you can. I think uh, this is when you realize one of the the good things about a situation like this. Is I think uh, as I, I've talked to several independent bookstore owners recently, and or you know people that work there, and and, and you're seeing the loyalty of the community. I hope y'all are seeing that as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I feel so, I mean, I, I have a, a, a feeling of loyalty and family with the store. I see me, um, Mamie Potter there, and I've known so many of the employees and, and the former owner, and I'm just impressed with the creativity and using this technology to fill in the gaps well and before we end i must my, my my sister is six feet tall and blonde and and fierce my brother and i were terrified of her growing up but i did not base serena on her <laughs> she just sent up something on the chat asking the chat. that <laughs> yeah. Well, wonderful. Uh, Sarah says this has been the highlight of her day. So you're welcome, Sarah. I'm just going to say you're welcome for these guys. Um, and lots of other very positive comments coming up. I do want to remind you all to go, and I think somebody had specifically said, hold up your most recent book. So Ron's is in the valley, and Randall's is if I had two wings. Hopefully they're not backwards for you. They are backwards for me. Um, <laughs> but hopefully you can see them the correct way. You should be automatically redirected after we um, close out this event over to quailridgebooks.com on a page that has these two books at the top and then lots of these gentlemen's fabulous backlist. So if there's anything you missed along the way, um, don't, don't be afraid to put a nice online order in. Um, and we are, of course, also open seven days a week. Um, we have shortened hours right now, but they're um, 10 to 6, or 10 to 7, excuse me, Monday through Saturday, and then 10 to 6 on Sundays. Um, masks are required. We are limiting the number of folks in the store at, at a time, but you can absolutely come in for browsing or um, place an online order and do contactless pickup or free media mail shipping. Yay. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ron. <laughs> and thank all you fo good folks for coming. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful Thursday night. <laughs>